and thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's September 2022, and this is episode 304, which is a conversation about transhumanism. Today's guest is Dr. Fuzz Rana, who is President, CEO, and Senior Scholar at the organization Reasons to Believe. He earned his PhD in chemistry from Ohio University, and he is the author of Who is Adam? and Humans 2.0. Fuzz has written a feature article in our upcoming print issue, which is volume 45, number two and three, for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called, Can Science and Technology Save Us? The False Gospel of Transhumanism. You can read his article if you are a subscriber. And if you'd like to read his article and you're not already a subscriber, please subscribe to our journal for $33.50 at our website, equip.org. Fuzz, it's good to have you on again. Melanie, thank you for having me back. I love the conversation we had a few months ago and looking forward to today's chat about uh, transhumanism and the relationship of transhumanism to the gospel. Well, as I mentioned, Fuzz has written an article for us in our print edition 45, number two and three, and he starts out in his article talking about Elon Musk. Now, a lot of us may have heard of Elon Musk. He's the richest person in the world right now, and he has really grand plans about humanity's future. He's been in the news a lot saying that there's not enough population. So he has all kinds of various different children out of wedlock. He's known for his electric car company, Tesla. And of course, more recently, he's had some public legal wranglings as he attempts to purchase Twitter. And of course, there's his company, SpaceX. So something people might not know about Elon Musk is he also has this other company that he founded in 2016, and that company is called Neuralink. So tell us a little bit about that company, Neuralink, and some of its mission and vision. Yeah, well, you know, Melanie, no matter who you are, and no matter what you think of Elon Musk, if nothing else, he's definitely an interesting person. And he's one of these people who likes to swing for the fence. He looks to develop big technology that's transformative, that he sees as really shaping the future of humanity. And Neuralink is just one of those types of companies where the goal is to, of Neuralink is to develop a cutting-edge, state-of-the-art brain-computer interface, which uh, can be used for humanitarian purposes. Many people see brain-computer interfaces as providing critical advances in biomedicine that will help us to treat people that suffer from brain injuries or neurological diseases that prevent them from communicating. They're locked in. Brain-computer interfaces can help them communicate by allowing the electrical activity of the brain to interface and to direct the activity of computer software and hardware and machine hardware. Some people see BCI technology brain-computer interface technology as, you know, helping to treat people that are amputees where they would learn to control robotic prosthetic limbs. Others see this technology as helping paraplegic and quadriplegic patients by giving them the means to control with their thoughts exoskeletons that give them mobility. So this is part of the objective of, of Neuralink and, and, in fact, one of the motivations for many people that are working with BCI technology. But Elon Musk wants to go one step further and to commercialize the technology, making it broadly available, where he envisions that this is the next generation in user interface technology between human users and the electronic devices that surround us everywhere we are today. So instead of giving a voice command you now are able to give a command with your thoughts using BCI technology to electronic devices, getting them to do what you'd like them to do. But one other objective of this technology in the vision of Neuralink is to use it as a means for human augmentation, where the thought is that this technology would allow the human user to interface with 
uh, computer systems, enhancing our cognitive abilities by coupling our brain power with computational power from uh, machines. And on top of that, enhancing our capacity for memory and data access, data retrieval. So the Neuralink has as its mission really a big vision that not only could transform medicine, maybe transform, again, how we interact with electronic devices, but really could transform the very nature of what it means to be a human being. Now, you've been throwing around this term brain-computer interfaces, but what is a BCI? Can you just break it down for us? And then besides some of the neurological applications that you've mentioned already, what other kinds of BCIs have been developed? And have there been any specific advances in this technology because of Neuralink, the company specifically in their research? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, BCIs are an emerging technology that has been under exploration for probably a couple of decades now. And the very first BCIs were fairly crude and primitive. And the, a BCI is simply an electronic device that allows for the electrical activity of the brain to be interfaced to a computer software or machine hardware. And the very earliest BCIs were modified EEG caps. Maybe you've had an EEG or you've seen someone through pictures having an EEG. These are these caps that go on our head with these electrodes that are laid on top of the skull and then record the electrical activity of the brain. And they've been used to study brain activity as well as a tool for diagnoses for different types of neurological conditions. And the first BCIs were modified EEG caps where the electrical activity of the patient was not only recorded, but then the patient learned to control the electrical activity in their brain in such a way to manipulate computer software. So the, the patient, through their thoughts, could then select a cursor or move a cursor on a computer screen to select a word, select a letter, that then would allow them to communicate in sentences. So this was a, a technology initially developed for people that are locked in. The problem with this technology is that it doesn't have very good signal to noise. And what that means is that the electrical signal from the brain gets attenuated as it passes through the skull and through the scalp. And then on top of that, these early BCIs are only able to measure the overall average electrical activity of the brain. It couldn't give you any kind of pinpoint as to where that electrical activity was coming from. This earliest generation of BCI technologies is called non-invasive. The next generation is called semi-invasive, where the BCI is actually laid on top of the brain. Now, that means that you have to do surgery to open up the skull to lay the brain-computer interface on the brain surface. It also means that you have to have electrical cables going in and out of the skull. But this actually improves the signal to noise, though there's a cost in the fact that you have to have surgery. You have this cumbersome device now coming out of your head. So it does improve signal to noise, but you still have very poor a spatial resolution in terms of detecting the electrical signal in the brain. The most current form of BCI technology is called invasive, where you literally are implanting the brain-computer interface into the brain. Now, this gives you the advantage of actually pinpointing the location of the BCI in the brain and allows you to record the electrical activity of thousands of neurons, not millions, which is uh, true for the other two types of BCIs that I talked about. And so it gives you very high signal to noise, very high resolution. Of course, the drawback is that you have to perform brain surgery on the patient to install the BCI. And you can get away from the cumbersome cables now with Bluetooth technology. So that's a significant advance. But the other drawback is that during the process of implanting the BCI in the brain, it can cause damage to local regions of the brain, and that leads to scarring. It's a foreign object in the brain that elicits an immune reaction uh, on the part of the patient. 
the glial cells that are in the brain will migrate towards these electrodes that are part of the BCI, coding them, and that causes the signal to be lost. And so there are significant you know, technical limitations with, with BCI technology. And this is where you know, Neuralink comes into play because they've made some really important advances where most people working in this area consider the BCI developed by Neuralink to be really beyond the state of the art, that they've made a significant advance in their technology. And it all hinges on the type of electrode that they're using for their BCI. These are very thin fibers of gold that are highly flexible, that are coated with a polymer called a polyimid, which is biocompatible. And this means that because it's flexible, when you're inserting it into the brain, it's less likely to cause damage to the brain. It's less likely to elicit an immune response, less likely to be coated by glial cells. And what Neuralink has done is they have combined 32 of these fibers, these microfibers, into a thread that then can be part of an electrode array that has 48 or 96 different threads attached to it. And then they insert the brain-computer interface device with a microsurgical robotic technology that gives them high precision ability to introduce this into the brain of the patient. So it's a huge advance that has solved some of the very serious problems with invasive BCI technology. And so this is a, a huge step forward. Now, they have only have done this work or studied their BCI on animal models, like pigs, for example, and they just have received... I think, approval from the FDA to progress their technology into small-scale human clinical trials. So it could very well be that in the near future, this technology is at least making its way into a clinical setting, if not into a commercial setting. But there's, you know, these BCI technologies, again, are going to revolutionize medicine, allowing patients to control, you know, computer software that lets them communicate control robotic prosthetic limbs, control, you know, exoskeletons, things like that. But there's also some interesting things that have been done in animal studies where people have shown that you can actually tether the brains of animals together using BCI technology where they are able to work as a collective to perform certain tasks that will give those animals a reward, for example. And and so it's quite possible that with this technology, you could one day envision tethering human brains together. And in fact, people have done some very interesting experiments where you can have people at opposite ends of the world through internet technology controlling computer hardware and software from remote locations, or even controlling the movement of another person's arm or finger through the use of BCI technology, where both test subjects have BCIs that are, again, integrated through the internet with one another. And so it's some really interesting and potentially bizarre applications. What's also fascinating to me is that the BCIs can also be used to send electrical information, electrical impulses into the brain that the brain learns to interpret. And so you can use BCI technology to feed information to test subjects in the reverse direction. It's not just simply going from the test subject to the computer hardware or in machine hardware and software, but it's actually going the other direction. Fascinating area of science and technology that, again, is at minimum going to revolutionize certain areas of medicine. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast brought to you by the Christian Research Journal. I want to give a big shout out to two of our listeners who did us a big favor and went to Apple Podcasts and gave our podcast a review. And that is Tatumville and Neil Macaroni and Cheese. Thank you to both of you for taking the time to just give us a few sentences about why you enjoy listening to this podcast and they are going to be automatically entered into our giveaway at the end of the year for a free subscription to the Christian Research Journal as well as other swag from the Christian Research Institute. But I would be very grateful if we could get more reviews up there because the more people that review us, 
the more people discover this podcast. So thank you. And of course, as always, if you haven't subscribed, you won't want to miss out on all the great articles that are coming your way that we're featuring in upcoming weeks on this podcast. And you can go to our website, equip.org to subscribe. Of course, I know that not everyone has it in their budget to subscribe. So please help us out. Maybe just give us you know, skip a coffee at your favorite coffee place this week and give us a tip for $3 or $5 or $10. You can do that at our website, equip.org. We've got a whole new look. You won't want to miss out on it right there on the front page. There's just so much free content that's available for you to equip you in your faith and help you defend the faith. So head on over to equip.org and hit journal and you can see the tab for Postmodern Realities Podcast. Any of the episodes will give you a link where you can give us a tip. But thanks, as always, just getting the word out, telling a friend, emailing your favorite episode, or putting it on your social media accounts. We really appreciate our partnership with you. Thanks for listening. Well, besides some of the physical issues you've mentioned where things could go wrong with the brain implants, what are some other reasons that Neuralink's, you know, different research might fail? And on the flip side too, you know, besides the fact that they have the state of the art, you know, devices, and you just mentioned some revolution for medical applications, what about some of their technology might succeed to do some very innovative things? Yeah, well, you know, the big problem with Neuralink's approach, and this is really true for most people working in BCI technology, is that it's very engineering heavy. And tends to neglect uh, some very important aspects of neuroscience. You know, and the ultimate metaphor that most people are using when they are considering BCI technology is that the, the brain is just like computer hardware. The electrical activity in the neurons is just like electrical activity going through wires in a machine. And that memory and emotions are nothing more than data that can be stored and retrieved. And then most people that are neuroscientists, you know, realize that this metaphor at one level is helpful in terms of the way to think about the brain and different activities in the brain, but to then base the development of technology in certain applications on this metaphor is is very dangerous. And so while it may be that this metaphor has very little impact on somebody, you know, learning to control a robotic prosthetic limb with their thoughts, When you start talking about doing things like augmenting our cognitive abilities, or you're talking about things like, you know, using this to enhance our memory and capacity for data storage and data retrieval, now you very well may be in problem grounds or sharing our memories and our thoughts with one another. And part of the problem here is that we really don't understand the relationship between the brain and the mind. And much of this technology is predicated on thinking of the brain and the mind as being either equivalent or the mind as being an emergent property of the brain. And so that in and of itself is problematic. But with neuroscience, for example, we can measure electrical activity in the brain when people are thinking, but we can't tell what it is they're thinking from that electrical activity that we can tell and we are beginning to understand the neurochemistry of how memory is stored and how memory is retrieved, but we can't tell what memories are being stored and what memories are actually being retrieved just from the neurochemistry. And so what you know, Elon Musk and other people that are working on BCI technology, particularly for some of these more advanced applications, are banking on is that we can convert that electrical activity into you know, meaningful information about user intent and about the deep content of what people are thinking and what people are remembering. Nobody knows where thoughts and and the specific content of thoughts or the specific content of memories is actually stored or housed in the brain or how it's actually retrieved. And so when we start thinking about the neuroscience facets of how the brain and the mind work, There are some assumptions that are being made by people that are pursuing this technology that very well may be faulty assumptions and most likely are faulty assumptions. You know, 
I mentioned at the very beginning of this podcast, you know, Elon Musk is quite a fascinating person, and he certainly has a lot of you know irons in the fire and wants to do a lot of grand things. So what is his ultimate motivation for pursuing this BCI technology? I mean, how does he think it's going to enhance you know, human life? Yeah, well, you know, for Elon Musk, the ultimate motivation behind Neuralink is almost an existential concern that he has for humanity's existence, because he's concerned about the advances that are taking place in AI and artificial intelligence. And he's concerned that in the very near future, we very well may develop AI systems that function autonomously and can actually not only you know, be used by humans for technology purposes for our benefit, but may actually wind up enslaving us, that we may become, in a sense, enslaved by the very AI technology that we create. And in fact, that this AI technology may even lead to our extinction as a human species. And so Elon Musk argues that this brain-computer interface technology is critical because it's going to allow us to interface our brains with computer systems, enhancing our cognitive abilities, our computational capacity as human beings, and our ability to store and manipulate data to give us essentially a capacity to compete with the advancing AI systems. So he basically is concerned that if indeed we don't develop this BCI technology, it very well may lead to the end of humanity. And in taking this particular view where he sees human augmentation as being absolutely critical to our survival, he in effect has signed on to a a philosophical movement known as transhumanism. Well, your article deals with transhumanism, but before we get to that, I want you to tell us a little bit more about AI. You're mentioning AI right now. What is it and you know, do we encounter it right now? You said that Elon Musk is fairly concerned about the ultimate impact on humanity from AI. And I find it interesting too, because a couple of years ago, Bill Gates was having, you know, people asked him for advice for college students. And he said, if you're a college student who's in STEM, definitely pursue AI. That's where the future is. You need to be learning about AI and go into that field. So what is it about AI that people in computer science, people like Elon Musk are so fascinated with, and they think that it's really important that we develop it? Yeah, well, the way to think about AI or artificial intelligence is that it's essentially a very sophisticated computer program that will take inputs and generate outputs, but based on the nature of the input and the output, it can learn from that process. It can modify its response to inputs and change the nature of its output in response to, again, what is the consequence of its activity. And so, for example, you know, with a computer program, you might say that if let's say a computer program that controls the temperature of the room. You might say that, you know, if the temperature of the room records above a certain value, that would be the input. Then the output would be to turn the air conditioning unit on. But, you know, maybe with a machine learning algorithm, it could become much more sophisticated where it would say, hey, if the temperature of the room goes above a set temperature, we're not going to turn on the air conditioning unit if there's nobody at home. That system is able to recognize that nobody is at home and learns when to turn the air conditioning on and when not to turn it on. And so the program has modified itself as a result of the input and the output so that it becomes, in a sense, uh, more sophisticated. This is called machine learning. And so there are what are called special AI systems, which are designed to perform very specialized tasks. So for example, recently researchers developed an AI system that could take the amino acid sequences of proteins and predict the higher order three-dimensional structure of proteins, right? And in the way it did this is by researchers giving it information about amino acid sequences and the type of three-dimensional structures of the proteins. It was like a training set that taught that AI system how then to 
interpret amino acid sequences in light of the tertiary structure of proteins, the three-dimensional structure of proteins. So that would be an example of, of specialized AI. And that type of technology is all around us right now. And whether we like it or not, we are already depending on AI technology for a lot of things. And in fact, some people think that you might be able to use AI technology to improve the ability of doctors to diagnose illnesses where you put in the patient's symptoms and you say, this is the diagnosis. And then that, again, AI system learns from all that experience in such a way that it can do very high precision, highly accurate diagnoses, maybe even better than the the human physician can do. So that's an example of specialized AI. The other type of AI that really I think people like Elon Musk are worried about is called general AI, where now the intelligence of these AI systems begins to approximate human intelligence. And we want to be careful here because these types of AI systems, while we might interpret them as being more and more like humans, at the end of the day, they're just very sophisticated computer programs that are very good at mimicking the human response to certain scenarios, but they ultimately are not thinking, they're not sentient. But there are people that believe that these kind of systems, if they become complex enough, could develop some kind of sense of self-awareness, could develop a sense of sentience, where they begin to operate autonomously on their own accord. And this is what has people like Elon Musk very frightened, is that if AI achieves that level of power, then we are now dealing with an actual intelligent entity that's essentially in control of a lot of the technology we depend upon, which then in turn could potentially enslave us. Well, your article is about transhumanism. So explain to us what transhumanism is. And you just talked about AI. Is it different from AI? Is it related to AI? AI and transhumanism are related in the sense that AI would be one of the technologies that people who advocate for transhumanism would like to make use of. And the idea behind transhumanism in a nutshell is that it's this philosophical movement that argues that we have a obligation to use science and technology to modify our biological makeup, to augment our capabilities to transcend our biological limits, to make ourselves more intelligent, more psychologically well-adjusted, to make ourselves physically stronger. Many people see that you know, much of the pain and the suffering in the world today are due to our biological limits and the flaws that they perceive that are part of our biological makeup as human beings. And so they want to go in and use technology to correct our flaws, to overcome our limitations. And in doing so, again, augment human beings, making us better suited, better adapted to the world that we currently find ourselves in. Uh, Many people who advocate for transhumanism see science and technology as the means to mitigate pain and suffering in the world, and they desire to create some kind of utopian future. And so people have always relied on science and technology to drive human progress. But the fact of the matter is, you know, what we're now looking at is this idea that we're not only just developing technology that we would make use of, we're developing technology that would essentially integrate with our biology, modify our biology to, again, enhance our capabilities. Some people who advocate for transhumanism think that the technology that's available to us to modify our bodies could actually extend our life expectancy to hundreds of years. Others think that if we can integrate machine hardware with our biology, kind of creating human cyborgs, that we would actually be able to extend our life expectancy maybe to thousands of years. Others think that if we could somehow upload our minds into a machine framework, we could attain a type of digital immortality. And so people are viewing transhumanism as a way to actually overcome death to grant humanity, individuals, a practical immortality. They're seeking to attain a type of eternal life through science and technology. And so at the end of the day, 
transhumanism really is a religious idea that is dressed up in technological language. It's dressed up in scientific language. But at the end of the day, it is really very much a religious idea. It's a type of gospel where science and technology are the means by which we find eternal life, we find salvation for us as individuals and for human beings as a collective species. Uh, This idea of transhumanism was long regarded as a fringe idea that most people didn't take seriously. They saw it as kind of the the fodder for science fiction, but given advances like we're seeing in brain-computer interface technology and other areas of, of biotechnology, suddenly this idea has become legitimate. Suddenly that the technology we need to fulfill the transhumanist agenda is available to us. And this idea is rapidly entering into the academic mainstream as a, a credible idea and is rapidly infiltrating our culture at large. I think in the next couple of decades, this very well may be one of the most important ideas that shapes the destiny of humanity apart from you know the gospel itself. So I'm curious to know if there's any kind of connection between transhumanism and, for example, evolution, like an evolutionary paradigm. I mean, what's the next step in evolution, according to science, if transhumanism is possible? Yeah, well, there is a a, a very close, tight connection between transhumanism and the evolutionary paradigm. Because if you view human beings as the product of an evolutionary history, first of all, it means that there's nothing especially sacred about humanity, that we're just part of this evolutionary tree of life, that there's nothing inherently special about us as human beings compared to any other creature that has ever existed. We're just you know, part of the world of nature as human beings. And so it eliminates any kind of sense of the sacredness of human beings. But also, if you view human beings as the product of an evolutionary history, then it means that our development, our evolutionary development, was constrained by the history of our evolutionary lineage. And that means that we have inherent limitations, inherent flaws in our biological makeup that just simply reflect the vagaries of the evolutionary process. And if, again, we have an evolutionary origin, it means that we are still, as a species, on an evolutionary trajectory where our current form is just simply a way station on this evolutionary journey for our species. And so the thought is that if that's the case, then why not step in with technology and modify our bodies if there's nothing sacred or sacrosanct about human nature? Why not correct the flaws that cause pain and suffering? Why not augment our capabilities? And if we're going to evolve, why not take control of our own evolution and and direct the evolutionary process to our desired ends? And so there's an intimate connection between really transhumanism and how we view the origin and the nature of human beings, where if you adopt a materialistic evolutionary view of humanity, then transhumanism makes logical sense. And in fact, in that sense, transhumanism almost becomes an imperative that this is going to be the only way that we're going to survive as a species is to actively take control of our own evolution to ensure that we are perfectly suited, perfectly adapted to the world that we will live in in the future, a world of our own making where we would make a world and then modify ourselves to fit perfectly into that world. In fact, for many transhumanists, the vision of the transhumanist future is a a type of eschatology. If you hold to a, a materialistic, atheistic view, there is no ultimate hope, purpose, or destiny for human beings. But with transhumanism, you actually create a sense of hope, a sense of destiny. You create a future for humanity that fills people full of hope from a materialistic perspective. So we started this podcast talking about the various different advances in BCI technology. And does BCI technology legitimize and advance transhumanism itself? I think for many people it does. Now, 
One thing that we want to be clear on here is this, that what is actually possible is different than what people think is possible, right, when it comes to transhumanism. And so with BCI technology, I think it's going to be a very powerful technology that will transform certain areas of medicine and really help us to develop better ways of treating horrible diseases and debilitating conditions for which we currently don't have effective treatments. It'll improve the quality of people's lives. I think that is very clearly what's going to happen with BCI technology. But to think that BCI technology could somehow give us a practical immortality or even augment our cognitive capabilities, our capacity for enhanced memory is something that I'm skeptical about. But as BCI technology progresses and as we see people perform some of these unusual experiments that we've talked about earlier, for people when they see those kind of advances, they really see this as suggesting that we're on a trajectory to maybe one day be able to, again, modify our bodies and integrate our bodies with machine hardware so that we can attain a practical immortality or maybe even upload our, our minds into a machine framework and give ourselves digital immortality. So these kind of advances really give people the hope that the vision that transhumanism has and the technology needed to fulfill that vision is really just over the horizon. So what about other technologies? We talked about AI a little bit, but is there anything else that gives credibility to transhumanism? I mean, it does seem very... I don't know, like Hollywood or just not even possible, but are there other things that are being developed to impact that and really make it a possibility? Yes. I mean, there's two other areas that currently really seem to fuel transhumanism. One of them is the advances in anti-aging technology. We've developed a really good understanding about the biology of aging to the point that there are many people working in biogerontology who think that one day we're going to be able in the near future to disrupt the aging process, maybe even reverse the aging process. And in fact, there are people like Aubrey de Grey, who's a transhumanist and also a biogerontologist who uh, believes that in the near future, we could extend the life expectancy of humans into the range of several thousands of years through a number of different interventionist technologies that again would reverse or at minimum arrest, but maybe even reverse the aging process. In fact, just in the last couple of years, there have been some small scale clinical trials published where people have developed different medical treatment regimes that have actually reversed their biological age by two or three years, where their chronological age continued to progress and their biological age reversed based on certain markers that correlate with the biological age of an organism. So this is something that, again, fuels the hopes of transhumanists. Also, there are advances in gene editing that are are now taking place, thanks to CRISPR gene editing technology, where we can perform high-precision gene editing on organisms' genomes. And this technology is very easy to use. It's very versatile, very powerful, very, very inexpensive and could potentially revolutionize medicine in another way in that it could allow us the means to treat genetic disorders and maybe even cure genetic disorders. So this is very exciting stuff, but if we can replace a defective gene with a healthy version of a gene, what's to say that we couldn't then create designer babies that have certain biological properties that we deem to be desirable And if that's the case, could we even go one step further and use gene editing technology to modify our genetic makeup in such a way that we make ourselves stronger, more intelligent? And so this is the type of technology that's, you know, emerging that really gives credibility and legitimacy to transhumanism. I think transhumanism is going to be, again, one of the most important ideas that will potentially shape the future of humanity. So are the applications that are being used in biogerontology, are they using BCI technologies? 
Uh, no, much of that involves things like stem cell technology, you know, where you can develop tissue and cellular replacements for damaged or defective or aged tissue. There are other techniques like uh, treatment of patients with an enzyme called polymerase, which helps to uh, extend the ability of cells to replicate beyond their natural limits. There's something called the Hayflick limit, which is limits the number of times a cell can actually replicate. And you can overcome that Hayflick limit with the treatment of an enzyme called polymerase. So these are some of the types of examples of the type of anti-aging technology that's available. The administration of human growth hormone, for example, can actually reverse the aging of the immune system. And uh, along with that actually reduces our biological age, or at least reduces the biological age of test subjects who receive those kinds of treatments. So these are the types of anti-aging technology. So it's in a sense separate and independent of of the BCI technology. So you could envision really a combination of technologies where a combination of gene editing, BCI technology, you know, as well as anti-aging technology working in conjunction to extend people's life expectancy in the future. You know, I'm wondering about any ethical issues connected to transhumanism technologies, because when you just mentioned in terms of the biogerontology and stem cells, is that fetal stem cells or what kind of stem cells are they using? Um, in some instances, fetal stem cells or embryonic stem cells. And, you know, when you think about the technologies that are energizing the transhumanist movement, these are technologies that have very important medical applications but even in the context of their medical applications, there is a whole host of ethical issues that have been identified. And in fact, people that work in bioethics are concerned that the territory that's being opened up with this type of technology from an ethical standpoint is unexplored territory, that we don't have any kind of real precedent for how to evaluate what technology we should pursue, and if we do pursue a technology, what are the limits? What are the constraints on that technology? In fact, there are some bioethicists who are crying out for a new type of ethical framework or progress in, in, in the types of ethical frameworks we have available to us to help us deliberate about these technologies. And unfortunately, things are progressing so rapidly that there's not time to deliberate about many of the ethical issues before the next wave of progress in advance is taking place. So ethicists are way behind the curve when it comes to this type of emerging technology. It's a real concern. And, you know, the ethical issues can really be categorized into four broad categories. You know, concerns about the loss of human worth and value and dignity. For example, if you start talking about cellular and tissue replacement therapies, you know, obviously you have concerns about the creation of embryos or the use of cells from fetal sources as a way to provide the raw material for that kind of cell and tissue replacement. That, of course, raises all kinds of pro-life issues and pro-life concerns. There's concerns about the exploiting human beings. You're going to have to have people that will be willing to be test subjects or women that will be willing to provide eggs egg donations for a lot of this work or for a lot of this technology. And these are people that are likely to be vulnerable and much more easy to exploit and likely will never take advantage of, of the emerging technologies that ensue. When you start talking about gene editing, if you're going to use gene editing to eliminate a genetic disorder in a human, you're going to have to use in vitro fertilization and then some kind of embryo selection process, which means those embryos that don't get selected are going to be destroyed. So a lot of issues on that front, issues relating to human identity, right, and human nature, and the, really the loss of human identity, the loss of human nature, concerns about the loss of autonomy and freedom. So for example, in brain-computer interface technology, some of these BCIs have been successfully shown to mitigate the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, which is very exciting. But what has been discovered is that people that receive 
BCI therapy for Parkinson's disease actually undergo a personality change in some instances where they actually become less risk averse. And so then the question becomes when they actually give consent for subsequent treatments with the BCI technology, is that actually a consent that they are giving or is that a consent that they are giving because of their modified personality? When we talk about BCI technology too, a lot of times we're you know, the, at least in the earlier generations of this technology, the patient was learning to control through the BCI computer software, uh, computer hardware. With more recent generations of BCI technology, what's happening now is that the electrical activity of the brain is being recorded and then is used to try to interpret the intent of the user. And so the question then becomes, who's actually making a decision about what to do? Is it the BCI that is making the decision, or is it the user of the BCI technology? Or is it some kind of collaboration? In other words, is that person's intent being misinterpreted by the BCI? Or is that BCI actually influencing the way that that individual with the BCI implant is thinking about things? So you start seeing, you know, a loss of human autonomy. In fact, BCI technology has spawned a whole new area of bioethics called neuroethics, where people are trying to wrestle with just the issues of BCI technology for medical applications. You know, and so when you start talking about these kind of concerns for medical applications, the ethical concerns just explode in diversity and complexity when you start talking about using these technologies for human augmentation, human enhancement. And so it's a really messy area that is deeply concerning, I think, for everybody, regardless of your worldview. And this is where I think the Christian faith has a very important role to play in terms of helping our society navigate the use of this kind of technology. Well, you noted a little bit earlier that transhumanism, it's on its face, it seems scientific and logical and based in, you know, various different experiments or medical or technological applications, but really it's religious in nature. And so what are some of the reasons that people should not put their hope in transhumanism to solve problems for humanity? And why is it really a false gospel? Yeah, well, the fact that we even had a brief chat about some of the ethical concerns related to technologies that undergird transhumanism in and of itself is, I think, reason to question whether transhumanism is actually a legitimate hope for humanity. Because these ethical issues really indicate that you're not going to attain a utopian future with transhumanist type of technologies, but rather you're opening up a very messy can of worms that could very well lead to a a dystopian future like many science fiction works, you know, promote as opposed to a utopian future. But apart from that, there has been a lot of work done in the philosophy of technology that has identified really issues with technology and the use of technology to augment human beings. So for example, One of the most devastating critiques of transhumanism is something called the salvation paradox, is that if we have to modify human beings to an extensive degree in order to attain a type of immortality, the problem is is that what we've created is going to be so different than what we actually are now that what we've actually saved is not ourselves, but something of our own making. Or if I think that I'm going to attain a digital immortality by uploading my mind, you know, into a computer framework, I'm not really uploading my mind. I'm uploading a copy of my mind. And so what gets that digital immortality is actually going to be a copy of my mind, not me myself. And so in other words, we're seeking after our own salvation, but what we are saving isn't actually ourselves. It's something of our own making that is experiencing that quote unquote salvation, that immortality, not us. So that's one problem that 
philosophers of technology have identified that to me, I think is absolutely devastating. Another problem is, of course, the fact that there's always unintended consequences connected with technology, you know, where uh, we may develop technology to solve a problem and it might very well solve that problem, but many times it creates new problems that are actually worse than the problem that it actually solved. And we end up trying to develop new technology to solve that new problem that emerges. And so we are kind of like that person trapped in quicksand that the more we try to escape, the more we become entrapped and enslaved by the technology that we develop. And again, that raises questions as to, is this really the pathway to genuine salvation? Something that transhumanists are highly guilty of, and that is they don't appreciate the impact of our sinful nature as human beings. This is something that Christians can bring to the conversation about uh, transhumanist technologies, is technology can be used for good, it can be used for horrific purposes, and the more powerful the technology, the more horrific the misapplication of that technology can be. And when we're talking about transhumanist technologies, we're talking about very powerful transformative technologies. And so you can only imagine the degree to which these technologies would be misused and misapplied. And so for these reasons, I think anybody that thinks naively that science and technology can save us is horribly, horribly mistaken. And it would be really a devastating tragedy to think that human beings would abandon the Christian gospel in exchange for a type of techno faith, a gospel centered on science and technology. And don't get me wrong, science and technology can improve the world that we live in, can improve the quality of our lives. It's something that can help us to fulfill our calling as Christians in terms of taking care of the planet, in terms of loving other people. But it's not something that is ever going to be able to save us We have to be very intelligent and and circumspect about how we use technology so it's used for the good. And if we are unwilling to do that, and we think that somehow technology and science can save us, we're going to be horribly, horribly disappointed. Now, there's a lot of dangers with transhumanism ethically and things that you mentioned just now that it doesn't really have the capacity to save us spiritually in any way. But does transhumanism relate to the Christian gospel at all? I think it does, and I think it does in a very powerful way. And in fact, as somebody who is a Christian apologist and who looks to use science and technology as a way to build a bridge to the gospel, transhumanism, or at least the interest, I should say, in transhumanism, is something that's very, very helpful in this sense. The ultimate motivation that undergirds transhumanism is the ultimate motivation that all human beings have which is a desire to connect to the transcendent, a desire to find hope, purpose, and destiny, a sense that their lives and their importance should extend beyond their lifetime. Transhumanists see the world that we live in as flawed, as wrong. They see pain and suffering that humans experience as wrong, that the world is not the way that it should be, and they desire to see a world in which the wrongs of this world are corrected and made right. They see death as the ultimate enemy, right? And so these are ideas that are the centerpiece of the Christian faith, that the world that we live in is broken. It's not the way it's supposed to be. And that we have the hope in the return of Jesus Christ for the wrongs of this world to be made right, that the pain and suffering we endure in this world is temporary and that We have the hope of a new creation where there will be no more pain and suffering. We see death as the ultimate enemy, and we desire to have eternal life. And we can find that eternal life in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have genuine hope for what's to come in the future. And that hope is what is being expressed by people that advocate for the transhumanist agenda. And so to me, this becomes the bridge point that the only thing transhumanists are really guilty of is looking for salvation in the wrong place. The desires that they express and their vision for what the future could look like in and of itself is not inherently wrong. 
in this sense, not that it's a future of our own making, but that it's a future that's utopian. It's a future filled full of hope, a future filled full of purpose, a future where death no longer reigns. And that's exactly the promise that the gospel offers to us. It's just that in the person of Christ, that hope will not be disappointed, but will be realized, will be fulfilled, that Christ is a trustworthy Savior, science and technology or not. Well, finally, on a more fun note, I have a fun rapid fire question for Fuzz, and we've been talking about AI. So Fuzz, Siri, Google, or both? Oh, I I think I like Siri best. Well, thanks, Fuzz, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thanks for having me, Melly. You've been listening to episode 304 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Today's guest was Dr. Fuzz Rana from Reasons to Believe. He has written a feature article in our upcoming print issue. You won't want to miss out on it. So please do subscribe if you already haven't subscribed, which you can do at our website, equip.org. His article is called Can Science and Technology Save Us? The False Gospel of Transhumanism. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Hanegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel, and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that, and every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. Mm-hmm.